time when the entries of our world were a mystery. The secret of what lay over the horizon led explorers and navigators to venture into the unknown. The further they traveled, the more pieces of the world map were drawn. The mysteries of the world were being revealed. Discovery came a map which changed the way people viewed the world forever. The men behind the map were the dynamic young team of Martin von Seemuller and Matthias Riemann and their mentor, Karen Faltel Wood. Their mission was to create a new vision of the world, combining ancient geographical knowledge and information drawn from stories of the dramatic new discoveries. The results would be a map, a globe, and a text which shocked 16th century Europe. The Valsimula map has become the most valuable and precious in the world. Only one copy has survived the ravages of time, and it resides here in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It was recently bought for a record-breaking figure of $10 million from a private collection in Germany. It has become an icon. It represents the beginning of America's existence in the modern world. Maps tell a story that can't be told in words, um, and they're just amazing way of figuring out our history. This map tells the story of the most exciting period of exploration in history. It's a map that made history as a landmark in geographical discovery, and it's a landmark in man's vision of his world. The importance of the Volksmuller map to America was realized by many who believed its natural home should be the United States. After negotiations over many years, the map finally landed on the shores of America. Amerika eine sehr junge Geschichte hatte, dachte ich mir, dieses Dokument muss in die Nationalbibliothek der Vereinigten Staaten kommen. The Valsemula World Map is unique due to one remarkable feature. It is the first ever map to name America and to show it as a new continent. Certificate of America. Sandie is the place where America was christened. It's a small rural community in France, close to the German and Swiss borders. Early in the 16th century, it was a town caught up in a cultural revolution. The use of woodblock printing in the nearby city of Strasbourg had reached the town. The mapmakers and intellectuals working within the cathedral at Sandier began to print their own maps and books. They received funding from a wealthy patron, which allowed them to publish radical new ideas. They became known as the Vosges Gymnasium, or University. The main motivation of the scholarly group of which Walter Miller became a leading member in San Diego was in cosmography, which was the Renaissance term for geographical science and map making. And they gathered as many texts and maps as they could, particularly about the discoveries across the Atlantic. They became particularly excited about this. Wolfsey Muller and Ringman embarked upon a major
Launching new venture. In this very room in San Diego Cathedral, they began to redraw the world. They were young men working at the dawn of a new modern age. Their new map would be revolutionary. The San Diego map makers would change the world. generations in the West came to believe the view of the world drawn from the Bible, ancient learning and mythology. A view based more on faith than observation, on belief rather than science. In Hereford Cathedral, England, can be found a medieval map known as the Mapa Mundi. It reflects the Christian view of the world. At its heart lies Jerusalem, the most important place on the map. Whilst at the edges, strange creatures are shown, lurking over the horizon. The map of in Hereford is the only surviving large medieval world map. It was put together in about 1290 and it incorporates the learning of the ancients plus such information as could be got about geography from the Bible. Nowadays we tend to look at maps with a practical aim in mind we want to get from A to B. With a map of Mundi, the aim was to convey to people something of the history of the world and the culture of the world and most important of all, the relationship between mankind and God. However, during the Renaissance, scholars and geographers began to question medieval maps in the light of new discoveries and the rediscovery of scientific ideas from the ancient classical world. You can't challenge an intellectual tradition like the Mapai Mundi unless, as it were, something revolutionary comes from outside. And it came from outside in the way of what we call the classical revival of the late Middle Ages. This is what we associate with the Renaissance, when many of the texts of the Greek and Roman world, particularly the Greek world, were rediscovered, translated, and made available to the West. The word Renaissance means rebirth, and it was a rebirth of ancient knowledge and philosophy which swept across Europe, challenging the medieval view of the world. Müller and Ringman from saint were part of a new Renaissance movement called Humanism. Artists, writers and scientists from across Europe explored new ideas, taking inspiration from the ancient classical world. Anything seemed possible. They would have been working in a world of scholarship, where people were intensively reading and questioning the old sources. On top of that, they were receiving new sources of information, so there was an atmosphere of great excitement, also an atmosphere, I think, of great comradeship, because there were humanists throughout southern Germany, indeed throughout Europe, who were exchanging ideas, who were pursuing the idea of finding the truth. The humanists used observation and logic to determine the truth about the world. But they needed information. This became available as the number of books being printed increased at a rapid rate. Books had been extremely few and far between. Yet during the Renaissance, printing presses across Europe published a vast array of new books. Scholars now had access to humanist libraries. such a library, where all the knowledge of the world could be brought together. The Sondier mapmakers could study works from the great ancient
of philosophers and scientists as they started to create their world map. One text in particular would inspire them. An ancient Greek text written 2,000 years ago would have more impact than any other on Renaissance map makers. The text known as Geographia was written by the father of all map makers, the ancient Greek geographer Claudius Ptolemy. The manuscript was the blueprint for a map of the world. It contained information which had been lost to the West since ancient times. The rediscovery of the Ptolemy text sparked a major change in the way the world was seen. It caused a sensation. The ancient Ptolemy text Geographia was discovered in a bookshop in Constantinople in 1300 by a monk called Maximus Planudes. He was astonished to find the document. The text was a manual which explained how to plot a map of the world. It included coordinates of 8,000 significant locations. It was a lost treasure. But its importance was not truly realized in Western Europe until a hundred years after its discovery, when it was finally translated into Latin. That the Geographica was translated in the early 15th century. And sooner or later, of course, it would challenge the whole framework of assumptions upon which the Mapai Mundi had been founded. The discovery of the ancient Greek text inspired humanist scholars to rethink what really lay at the edges of the world. was a geographer working in Alexandria, Egypt, during the 2nd century AD. He was the most important map maker ever to have lived, and the rediscovery of one of his lost texts was incredible. The Geographia started to spread like wildfire across Europe. Explorers and navigators were inspired to travel the world as mapped by Ptolemy. Geographia was one of the first books other than the Bible to be widely circulated. It became fashionable for Renaissance map makers to create their own versions of the world as described by the ancient master. British Library in London, an early printed copy of the Ptolemy map can be found. This is the first edition of Claudius Ptolemy's Geographia to be printed north of the Alps. It was printed in all in 1482, and this is a particularly luxurious version because it's printed on parchment. At the beginning of the 15th century, the texts and the maps were brought over to Rome, translated. They created a sensation because they presented a completely new way of looking at the world and a new way that was actually all the more exciting because it appeared to have the stamp of approval of antiquity and this was very, very important in the Renaissance. When Waldfe Muller, Ringman and their mentor, Canon Wood, started work on their 1507 world map, they too used Ptolemy's Geographia to create the Old World. On the top left of their map can be seen an image of Ptolemy looking down at the ancient world. Yet there was a problem. Valtimur almost certainly used a map like this for his information about the parts of the world where he hadn't got more recent knowledge. And I think this is the real problem, that by the 1490s, certainly by the early 1500s, most people knew 
that there were great errors in Ptolemy. The major flaw in Ptolemy's work was that he underestimated the size of the world. He believed that there were only three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. ventured out to sea in the 15th century, Ptolemy maps were their guide to the extent of the world. As new discoveries were made, they were added to Ptolemy maps. Yet the updated maps continued to show only three continents, and this led to mistakes. Christopher Columbus studied an updated Ptolemy map made by Henricus Martellus in 1490 when planning his famous voyage of 1492. But Columbus misunderstood the geography of the world by studying a misleading map. It's thought that Columbus did have a Ptolemy map and that that encouraged him to go out and seek the Indies by moving in a westward rather than eastward direction because he didn't realize just how large the world was, how huge the Atlantic was. He thought that it would be a much shorter journey, judging by the dimensions of the Ptolemy map. Columbus was an Italian who won backing from the Spanish king. The 15th and 16th centuries were an age of exploration and conquest. Europeans were looking for riches, silks and spices, which they believed could be found in Asia. The goal was to find a trade route to the east. from Portuguese pushed furthest into unknown territories. Some explorers, such as Columbus, claimed they were sent by God to the new lands. Yet the real reasons may have had more to do with greed. It was all very well to have grand ideas about finding out about unknown worlds, and it was very grand to have an ideological commitment about finding new Christian peoples or converting pagans. But the real hard-edged motivation behind it and the money was attracted to these ventures through the kinds of economic advantages that it was believed that they would bring. People knew of the mystical East through the popular tales written by Marco Polo. The colorful stories of his adventures in China in the 13th century captured people's imagination. But in the 15th century, Marco Polo's route to China was impossible. The people of the Renaissance could not get to China as Marco Polo had done overland because all those routes were blocked by the Islamic occupation of the Middle East. Therefore, they studied their geography, they studied their globes and their maps, and Columbus in particular reached the insight that if he sailed west, he would find Cathay, and he would find the sea route to the east. He wasn't looking for new lands, he was looking for new routes to lands which were well known to the European scholars. to find a new trade route to China led to the age of discovery. The Portuguese explorers traveled south, attempting to go around Africa to find a new route to China. However, Columbus, who sailed under the Spanish flag, was adamant about his plan to sail west in order to find Asia in the east. He made the brave decision to attempt a route across the Atlantic Ocean. Yet Columbus did not realize the maps he was using were flawed. He was literally sailing out into the unknown, and the risks were great. 
Sailing into uncharted waters was a dangerous plan. For Columbus and the other early explorers, it was just an incredible leap of faith. Imagine going into outer space, but unlike going into outer space, you don't know what the surface of the moon looks like. You don't know what the solar system is. You're going into the unknown. The idea of an uncharted world isn't something we can appreciate. These guys were sailing into the night, literally, without any idea that they would ever come back. Columbus eventually sighted land on the 11th of October, 1492, after 64 days at sea. He had believed that he would find the Asian continent much earlier than this, but in fact, he was not in Asia. He had found islands off South America we now know as San Salvador, Haiti, and Cuba. He felt sure that the islands were off the Asian mainland, and he embarked upon several unsuccessful journeys trying to find a passage through to China and Japan. Although Columbus had not found Asia, the information he brought back from his voyages was crucial to the map makers in Europe, who were intrigued by the new discoveries. There is one map believed to have been drawn by Columbus, which details the islands he found. Este es el facsimil de una carta de la española, la primera hecha y creemos debida a Colón y entonces muestra el norte de la isla de Haití o Santo Domingo que ellos les llamaron la española esta isla fue muy importante para la corona española en un principio porque aquí es donde poblaron donde principalmente poblaron organizaron el gobierno y Colón era el virrey de esta isla, virrey y gobernador de esta isla. De ahí la importancia de que Colón es, dibujara su primera posesión en, en América. Following this new information, mapmakers added the lands, but no one realized they were anything other than a cluster of Asian islands. Several years after the first of the reports from the New World, the mapmakers in Sondier, Vladzimula and Ringman began collecting the maps and information which would help them piece together their very different map of the world. One crucial source they used were hand-drawn manuscripts known as Portland charts, which were used by navigators to determine trade routes. They recorded who held claim to which new territories. Sea charts provided invaluable information for the Sondier map makers. They would use a combination of ancient information, stories from explorers, and Portland sea charts to gradually build their new map. It was perhaps the most exciting time as they were concerned since ancient Greece and Rome because they had all of the knowledge of the ancients, but there was important new information coming in almost on a daily basis from overseas. For the previous decades, there'd been information about the discovery of Africa and the coastline of Africa. Then, since about 1492, news had been coming over of unknown lands that had been found to the west of Europe, but apparently, possibly, before China. The Sun DA map makers studied all the information which was available to them in their attempt to create a true picture of the world. This sort of environment is the ideal environment for the scholar who has to sort of find out what is actually happening and what's the truth. And if you're a map maker, it's not sufficient simply to know what the truth is. You have to put it on the paper. Muller and Riemann must have been aware of the work of one navigator and mapmaker who provided more detail than anyone else about the Spanish discoveries. His name was Juan de la Cosa, 
and he was vital to Columbus's voyages. He owned and mastered the Santa Maria, one of the three ships used by Columbus. He recorded with great detail the lands which he visited on Spanish explorations. One sea chart created by Juan de la Costa can be found in the Naval Museum in Madrid. It tells the story of the first voyages to the Americas. It was produced as a gift for the Spanish king in 1500 and is the first map which shows the known world and the islands and landmass of America. However, the land remained unnamed. Juan de la Cosa did not make it clear if he believed it to be a part of Asia or a new continent. Quiero mostrarles aquí la joya del Museo Naval, que es la carta de Juan de la Cosa, está aquí firmada, hecha en 1500 en Puerto de Santa María. Lo más importante de este mapa es la parte en el que está representada América, las islas, Cuba, Haití. Es también muy importante África porque están representados todos los descubrimientos de los portugueses. Y luego esta parte, que es la parte de Asia, tiene interés porque están representados todas las historias de Marco Polo. Probablemente Valsmiller conoció este mapa porque él introdujo en su mapa los descubrimientos españoles. Este es un, uno de los mapas más importantes de aquella época. Seguramente conoció o bien este mapa o una copia de él, pero no cabe duda que lo utilizó en su construcción de su mapa. get access to the many rare and often secret documents which they needed. The canon of Fondier, Walter Lutz, had connections with the powerful aristocrat René, the second Duke of Lorraine. He was the patron who funded their work, freeing them from commercial constraints. The Duke received top secret information from fellow aristocrats and rulers across Europe who wished to influence him. The Duke of Lorraine had a strategic role in Europe. He was a man who was worth flattering. They knew that the Duke of Lorraine was interested in intellectual matters, so instead of giving him a bribe or anything trash like that, they sent him a map of the latest discoveries. And what did the Duke of Lorraine do with it? He passed them on to his favorite scholars in San Diego. With the help of the Duke, the mapmakers at San Diego studied the most recent maps of the time. Such as this world map by Contarini, which may have found its way to San Diego. This map was printed in 1506, just one year before the Waldseemuller map, and shows an unusual circular view of the world. It includes many new discoveries. However, it still has one important piece missing. West of the discoveries, a mass of clouds covers the map, leaving a huge question as to what lay between the new found lands and Asia. the world map created and printed by Waldseemuller and Ringman the following year, which would be the first ever to name the new continent and identify a vast ocean between the new land and Asia. The inclusion of a sea west of America on the Waldseemuller map begs the question, did explorers travel around America much earlier than previously thought? There is a great mass of water. If you take the scale on the Waldseemuller map, this mass of water has to be several thousand miles across. It's dotted with islands, and Japan is shown quite clearly some thousand miles off the coast of China, just exactly where Marco Polo said it was. And so you have this great mass of water lying to the west of Americas, not shown on any other map of the period. And as far as we know, there are no written sources, no sources in the literature of exploration which can justify this, and this is the enigma which Waldseemuller has bequeathed us. But did Waldseemuller and Ringman have 
secret information about what lay to the west of the new lands? Or is there another explanation? The major difference between this map and any other of its time is that the map makers decided not to show the new lands as a few islands or part of an ocean. decided to add a fourth continent. This meant they were claiming the world was much larger than anyone had previously realized. And if the new land was a continent, by definition it must be surrounded by ocean. To introduce this concept of a fourth continent uh, was just remarkable a concept that had not even been thought about before. They named the new continent America. It was a revelation. Amazingly, the Sondier mapmakers did not credit the discovery of the new continent to Christopher Columbus, who has been hailed as the man who discovered America. And they did not name the new lands after him. Columbus is seen as the first pioneer who went out to discover America. But the reality is that he didn't discover America at all. He discovered the West Indies. He himself thought he discovered the East Indies. He was under a misconception about the lands he had found. So if Columbus didn't land on mainland America, then who did? And why do the Sondier mapmakers call the new continent America? The answer lies with an explorer named Amerigo Vespucci. Vespucci was an excellent navigator. Having worked for Columbus, he decided to take his own fleet of ships west to see the newly found lands for himself. was an Italian, funded by the King of Spain. He set sail five years after Columbus's maiden voyage to the West. However, it would later be Vespucci and not Columbus who would have a profound effect on Valtremola and Riemann's map of the world. If you look at the top of the map, you see an intriguing double portrait there. You see on the left-hand side, picture of Ptolemy, the geographer of the old world, who definitively mapped the Greco-Roman world in the first century AD, and then counterbalancing on the right, you see this portrait of Vespucci, who is the discoverer of the new world. So those two seem to sum up everything that is known about the world at that time, and Voltimil obviously regarded the two of them as the twin pillars of geographical knowledge. But why should Valsimola and Ringman have placed so much emphasis on the discoveries made by Vespucci? According to Vespucci's accounts, he travelled to the mainland of America, arriving in what is now Florida. Unfortunately, Vespucci's accounts are thought to have been exaggerated, making it difficult to be sure exactly where he landed. Yet during his explorations, Vespucci did realize that America was a great landmass, and it bore no resemblance to the Asia described by Marco Polo. Therefore, he came to the conclusion that it was an entirely different continent. His four voyages to the new lands were recorded in a series of letters. He wrote prolifically, and the tales he told of the new continent reached the mapmakers working in Sangier. Copies of Vespucci's manuscript letters still survive and are held in the archives of the Library of Congress in America. These letters were dynamite. In them, Vespucci laid out his ideas that a completely new part of the world, unknown by Europeans, had been found. This was a very different idea from Columbus, who never accepted there was a fourth continent. 
technology had made a major breakthrough. Ringman became aware of the letters and was fascinated by the claims that Vespucci was making. These letters actually were the first letters that made sense of what had been happening over the ocean in what we call now the New World, and what Vespucci himself felt was a new world. A printed copy of Vespucci's letters was published by Ringman. It was called Mundus Novus, or New World. Amerigo Vespucci was saying, this land that Columbus discovered, that others had sailed around, were not islands or peninsulas attached to the Asian mainland, but was a separate continent. It was Vespucci's letters which inspired Ringman to include a fourth continent when creating the Valsemura world map. Ringman was the man with the ideas and vision, whilst Valsemura was an expert draftsman who drew the map. The impressive wall map was completed in 1507. Twelve expertly carved wood blocks were used to print at least 1,000 copies. It was purchased by merchants and scholars across Europe. Previously, such maps would only have been available to royalty or the aristocracy. At the Library of Congress, the map has been studied by conservators. It has revealed some fascinating details. What you see here are white lines, and that is actually not an original part of the design. The laminated boards must have started splitting over time. Also, you can see these areas where the ink did not print, and that is because there was actually some space in the wood. And that is caused by these areas having been replaced at a later time. They had to actually cut out a portion of the block and ultimately redraw the design. And you see that evidence here. The Valse Muller map was a vision of the world based on evidence, but also speculation. It wasn't until Ferdinand Magellan circumnavigated the world in 1519 that Ringman and Valse Muller's image of the world was proven to be right. Their map was incredibly significant. Yet over the centuries, all copies were lost or destroyed, until not one remained. The only evidence that the map ever existed was to be found in a booklet by Ringman. I'd like to show you the 1507 Cosmographia Introductio. This small book is wrapped in a 15th century manuscript, basically serving as its dust cover. The Cosmographia Introductio was a booklet written by Ringman to accompany the map. The book was basically an introduction to their research project in trying to synthesize the information coming back from the New World. Ringman and Valsemuller's map was a major achievement. The young men had been radical and bold, knowing that their map would spark a storm of controversy. At the time of publication, the map must have seemed outrageous. Yet it has become a historical landmark in map making. As many years passed, new generations of scholars sought the Waldseemuller map. A copy might still exist, but where could it be? In the southern corner of Germany stands Wolfeck Castle. It was here in 1901 that two Jesuit priests were on a mission to chronicle the works of art owned by the Prince of Waldburg Wolfeck. They sorted through thousands of documents, collected over hundreds of years. The Prince was an avid collector of maps and prints, a 
and the castle contained an overwhelming number of documents. Yet one priest, Joseph Fisher, found a tantalizing clue. As he searched the inventories, he found one reference to the Volksemuller map. He recognized it immediately, and knew he could be close to finding the map. But it wouldn't be an easy task. The castle contained one of the most important and extensive collections of prints in the world. We have here also einen von ungefähr zehn Räumen, die von ähnlicher Größe sind und die auch bis hoch an die Decke voll mit Regalen und Büchern sind. Und man kann sich gut vorstellen, dass in dieser überbordenden Fülle von, von Büchern und Dokumenten eine Weltkarte wie die des Martin Walzemüller einfach nicht so einfach leicht aufzufinden ist. Yet Fisher did find the map, much to the amazement of map collectors and museums throughout the world. Hidden amongst the rows of thousands of books, Fisher noticed a leather-bound volume. He had found a book which had once belonged to a famous globemaker, Johannes Schoner. When Fisher opened the book, much to his amazement, he discovered a perfectly preserved print of the 12 sheets of the Waldseemuller map. The map had only survived because unusually, Schoener had bound it instead of mounting it on a wall. It was a fantastic find, the first document in America's modern history. The American government realized they had to have this map. However, negotiations spanned over 80 years as the German government refused to allow the map to be exported. In 1992, Margaret Krusen, an expert from the Library of Congress, went to Wolfegg Castle to examine the map for herself. Als ich die Karte zum ersten Mal sah, war ich schon fasziniert von dem Schloss und dem äh, Turmgebäude des Schlosses. Und ich war fasziniert, in welch gutem Zustand die Karte war, der herrliche Einband, alles war äh, so hervorragend erhalten, weil diese Karte immer in einer Familie war. Und äh, ich sagte mir dann, jetzt verstehe ich, weshalb die Kongressbibliothek die, diese Karte schon seit so langer Zeit wollte. Prince of Waldburg Wolfegg realized the true value of the Waldseemuller map and its importance to America. The Congress Bibliothek is ja seit äh, über 80 Jahren äh, daran interessiert gewesen, die Karte zu erwerben und diese, diese Nachhaltigkeit in ihrem Wunsch hat sich halt dann schließlich in der Akkusation kulminiert. Although the German government believed the map to be a German national treasure, they did eventually grant permission for the map to be sold to America. It was a controversial decision, but one which the prince believes was right. Es ist einfach zu einzigartig, um nur in, in einem Schloss in Süddeutschland versteckt zu sein. Und es macht mich eher stolz, dass jetzt in eine große Zahl von interessierten ähm, Menschen Zugang zu dieser Karte haben und die Werte, die sie äh, repräsentiert, eben auch selber anschauen können. 500 years after it was printed, the Waldseemuller map finally arrived in America. It was bound in the original portfolio in which it was found in Wolfegg Castle 100 years earlier. The Library of Congress undertook the process of restoration and preparing the map for exhibition. The mapmakers never saw America for themselves, yet 
they were the ones to name the continent. This would be the map's legacy to the world. But why do they call it America? Was it after Amerigo Vespucci, whose letters had so influenced Ringman? At Celestar Humanist Library, near saint -Dié, a rare edition of Ringman's booklet, Cosmographia Introductio, reveals the naming of America. In the document, Ringman explains why he chose the name for the new continent. Voici la fameuse cosmographie dite de Saint-Dié. Cet ouvrage est particulièrement important pour cette fameuse page où vous avez un paragraphe avec dans la marge bien mis en valeur le mot « America ». À cause d'Amérique au Vespucci, donc il publie bien sûr euh, les lettres, et euh, c'est donc ce texte que certains historiens ont appelé comme étant l'acte de baptême de l'Amérique. In an extract of the text, Ringman says, I see no reason not to call this other part Amerigi, that's to say the land of Amerigo, or America, after the wise man who discovered it. Ringman had no doubt that it was Amerigo Vespucci who truly found the new land. But why choose the name America rather than Amerigo? Walsing Miller applied the name America to the new continent in honor of Amerigo Vespucci. But in coining this name, he was following a practice that was used for the other continents. Europe, Africa, and Asia were feminine names, and in adapting the name Amerigo, he changed it to America. The Somme de Vey mapmakers were working under the patronage of the Duke of Lorraine. Yet there have been suggestions that perhaps Vespucci himself may have had a hand in the creation of the Vaxe Muller map. I think it's highly likely that he did at least cooperate with, if not commission, Voltimula to produce these maps, and therefore the Voltimula maps could be said to be the Vespucci maps. They embody Vespucci's discoveries, his ideas, and his, his vision of the world. Whether or not Vespucci had any direct influence over the creation of the Voltimula map is still unknown, yet he would have gained great status from its publication. Tragically, shortly after the Valtse Muller map was published, Matthias Ringmann died, aged only 29. Soon after, Valtse Muller would draw another very different map of the world, without Ringmann. The Carta Marina is a navigational sea chart that was created in 1516. What is interesting about this map, in contrast to the 1507 map, is that Walter Mueller has ceased to use the name America. Also, he does not depict the west coast of North and South America as he did in the 1507 map. And this is North America. The new map is ambiguous about the new continent. So why did Valtse Muller revert to an earlier view of the world? And why today has Vespucci been largely forgotten? There were many claims that Vespucci lied about his discoveries, or at least embellished them. When he became aware of these rumors, Valtse Muller went back to other sources, such as this chart by Niccolò Caveri, drawn in 1504. It shows the new lands, but does not credit Vespucci, or claim the lands are a new continent. When Columbus died in 1506, his heirs began a campaign to reinstate him as the man who discovered America, and to disgrace Vespucci. But the name would not be forgotten. So influential was the 1507 Valtse world map, the generations of mapmakers continued naming the new lands America. Historically, 
People have thought the Sandia mapmakers mistakenly named America after Vespucci. A lot of New World history and American history um, is full of accidents. But I have always thanked Falsi Mueller. I wouldn't want to live in Colombia, and I think it's quite wonderful that our national identity comes from a gigantic mistake. Yet was it a mistake? Columbus did reach the islands of South America first, yet it was Vespucci who traveled to the mainland and who realized the significance of the new continent. It is for this that he will be forever remembered. Although he has been branded a liar, perhaps Americo Vespucci holds the greatest honor. The map remains a testament to those Renaissance explorers and to the map makers at Sondier who threw caution to the wind and created a vision of how they saw the real world. Can be seen the beginnings of the modern America we know today.